All right, thank you for tuning in to our second edition of part six of our continued series, There Is No Collapse, because the collapse already happened. All right, um, picking up where we left off, we we're finishing up on what, looking at usury and how the global banking system uses usury to enslave not only citizens and nations and peoples. And we've been looking at you know, scriptures, what the Bible says about uh, usury. So I want to finish that up and then we're going to get into our next section and get into some really heavy stuff here, what's going on. It seems like as soon as I started doing this series that there's been so much news that's been coming out lately, it's almost hard and impossible to keep up because as I put out new information new information is, is, is coming out confirming everything I've already told you thus far and if you haven't already done so I, I strongly urge you to take the time out to listen to the uh, the wide awake news radio playlist in the bottom of the description of this video because a lot of the things that are happening now the news that's coming out now I've already spoken about Charlie and I we already covered it tackled it and exposed it just about everything you've been hearing about um, also <laughs> there's been some new developments that are things that have come that uh, I've, I've gotten an overwhelming response people want me to deal with so I will be dealing with that in our um, upcoming installments but for now let's let's get into the meat of this one all right finishing up looking at uh, at usury alright uh, Deuteronomy 15 uh, 1 and 2 says at the end of every seven years you shall grant a remission of debts this is the manner of remission every creditor shall release what he has loaned to his neighbor he shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed all right, so here we are talking about uh, the releasing of debt, releasing the burden of debt, erasing it, okay? Uh, loan forgiveness, if you will. Hebrews 13.5, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Proverbs 22.26, do not be among those who give pledges, among those who become grantors for debts. Proverbs 11.15 He who is guaranteed for a stranger will surely suffer for it, but he who hates being a guarantor is secure. Philippians 4.11-13 Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And finally, 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. All right, final conclusion. The whole idea of usury is to program the masses of would-be slaves to embrace the burden of debt. We are taught in Western society that debt is good, that usury is good. And they, the, the marketing for banking, in my humble opinion, is the most successful marketing campaign in all of human history. I believe it surpasses De Beers marketing of diamonds. And all you have to do is just look at do a cursory view of history to see how this has come about. The whole credit card thing. At the end of the day, everyone now works for the bank. The bank owns the note to your home. The bank owns the note to your car. All right, the two biggest quote unquote purchases you will make, the bank has conditioned the minds of the masses to see it not as debt but as an investment. Okay, they tell you it's an investment, they've now 
got changed the meanings of words and now tell you that debt is an investment. It is not an investment. A home is not an investment. A home is not an investment. Again, a home is not an investment. All right, it's a depreciating asset. Period. All right, it's just how it is. All right, and why is not why is a home not an asset? It's it's a liability because anything that you have to cut a check for to the bank every month is a liability. Anything that is uh, income producing, putting money in your pocket every month, is an asset. All right, it's a liability, man. A home is only an asset, okay, if the value of it is increasing above and beyond what you owe on it, which is rare, and or it is income generating. So, for example, all right, because I I don't take for granted that everyone is able to follow what I'm saying. So let's let's break down a quick scenario. Okay, I have a home that I bought. All right, not that I live in, but that I bought as an investment property. I rent it out. Let's say I pay a hundred thousand dollars for this house. Let's say my mortgage is five hundred dollars a month. I rent the house out uh, for let's say uh, six hundred dollars a month. Okay, this is no longer a um, depreciating asset. It's no longer a liability. It's now an asset because I'm generating income for it more than what I owe on it. Does that make sense? So if I have to pay the bank 500 a month, but the person renting it is paying me 600 a month, I'm walking away for $100 profit at the end of every month. So that's how that works, okay? Um, those who invest in, in apartment buildings uh, generally do a lot better than individuals who have, you know, individual houses and they rent them out. Because, for instance, I can uh, buy, let's say, an apartment building that has, let's say, for sake of argument, 100 units in it. And let's say I pay a million dollars for this building. And let's say that my mortgage on this building is $12,000 a month. But I rent out each apartment for $1,000 a month. You see where I'm going with this? All right, now I'm making money hand over fist. It's no longer a liability. It's an asset. It's an investment at that point. Okay, well, credit card debt, revolving credit debt, installment loan debt is still debt. It's called debt. All right, it's called revolving debt or installment debt. It's, it has the word debt at the end of it. Okay, not asset, but debt. So they have brainwashed the public to tell them that this debt is good, that being a slave to a lender is good. All right, and they fill you full of hopes and dreams that you'll be able to pay it off and it's not a problem. And then you keep going into debt, you're always indebted, and they've They've ingrained it in the minds of the average person that this is all you can do and all you can be. You can't go buy a car and pay cash for it. No one has that kind of money. You can't go write a check for a house. No one has that kind of money. That's what they tell you, that no one has that kind of money, and especially not you, and you never will, you never can, so you never strive to do it. All right? Well, first of all, who said you have to even cut a check for a house? Uh back, you know, looking at our ancestors, they didn't have to pay a bank to build a house. They just went and built a house. All right. We'll get into that later. But the fact of the matter is our whole economy is based on debt and spending. All right. Not investment, but spending. All right. It's foolishness. All right. And this usury is what's bringing down and collapsing the society. All right. It's collapsing the society, all right, because of debt. You strangle and choke people to death with debt. All right, let's move on. I, I, we've looked at usury now. Let's take a look at the how and the why and the who. How is this happening? Why is this happening? And who's doing it? All right. <clears throat> The Treaty of Versailles, negotiated at the Palace of Versailles, that had once been the Court of Versailles, where the conclusion of the American Revolution War had been dictated, was now the personal residence of one Lord Rothschild, 
who would orchestrate the peace agreement that concluded the war to maximize the leverage of the central banks he controlled and the use of debt to control the various nations of Rome's behalf. All right, so he did this on Rome's behalf. Germany would be saddled with all the outstanding debts of England and France, even though it had not started the war and technically wasn't even losing it. All right, Treaty of Versailles. The United States would be placed in an equally awkward position as it, as <clears throat> it had loaned through the Federal Reserve most of England and France's war debt. See how they, they finance? <laughs> See how they, they do the financing here? The Roman patrons like Rockefeller and DuPont had made fortunes through their oil and weapons holdings and patents. But sadly, the American taxpayers, economic slaves they are, would have to pay for it all. Germany was in no position to pay the debt, and America would be in no position to not be paid. The economies of both would soon spiral into recession. Depression and hyperinflation that were conspired to make World War II a thing that would happen in short order and induce the war weary and horrified citizens of these countries to fight yet again. All right, see, war, the, see, the, the, the never ending cycle of debt and war. One might wonder why Germany and the United States would agree to such terms. The truth is that the financial aspects were negotiated by the heads of the Federal Reserve and the Reich Bank. At that time, the head of the Federal Reserve was a man named Paul Warburg, and the head of the Reich Bank happened to be Max Warburg. Coincidentally, they happened to be biological brothers and the family long associated with the Rothschild family. Now, Rome tries to keep things in the family. That's what they do. They, they keep it all in the family. Uh, the patrons of Rome were hoping that the horrors of the war could tempt the people of the nations to start laying the foundations for the one world government through the League of Nations, which would start to implement collective security with the promise that aggressor nations would be quickly dealt with by the League of Nations to prevent such wide-scale wars in the future. Sounds like a noble plan, right? <laughs> Let's look at this League of Nations. They attach this to the Treaty of Versailles, uh, but when a, a independent U.S. Congress that had to ratify the treaty began to read about all the side deals and manipulations of the Balfour Declaration and the Treaty of Versailles, financial uh, arrangements, you know, back deal, back room situations, they realized that America had been seriously duped and tricked into the war and left in a terrible position after it financially had rejected it. So Rome is persistent through and, uh, through, and through its chief American and oligarch Rockefeller family. So they quickly founded the, the CFR. What's the CFR? It's the Council on Foreign Relations. How does that fit into this picture? All right, we're, 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 we're looking at the different uh, tentacles of this octopus, all right, which builds this whole, which is going to lead us to this electronic network that we got. The Council on Foreign Relations would eventually lead to the creation of the United Nations, all right, after World War II, but they play an independent and active role in the American political landscape still to this day. This main mission is to promote a one world government by working actively to submerge American sovereignty through placing as much of America's wealth in the fewest hands possible and using that power and control of America's wealth to manipulate political events toward entering America into an increasingly stifling set of international treaties that cede portions of its sovereignty and wealth to the world body until there's no wealth and sovereignty left at all. There was one problem though. War doesn't really make money since money is just paper, or in this case, uh, zeros and ones. It eats up resources, um, though, that do have a real value. So once the founding of Israel was secured through the Balfour Declaration and the conquest of Palestine, it made sense to end the hostilities from a financial aspect. But the nations were already enslaved enough to the the uh, the fictional and illusionary debt, you know, the zeros and ones, that would tax the citizens and rob them of quality of life and freedom as a result.
yet they had hoped to kill many more people in the hostilities than had actually died. No problem for Rome, though. If they can't get you um, to, uh, you know, profitably and economically kill one another, then they just kill you by the means. All right. Now this this fits into the whole depopulation agenda, as of that's part of the why all this stuff is happening, and we get into biological warfare, because what we know biological warfare happened when, uh, you know, when we we. We, we, we wiped out all the Indians, all right, using smallpox blankets and things like that. So biological chemical warfare goes back for centuries. Well, let's look at the 1918 flu pandemic. It came out of nowhere, spread quickly, and up to 100 million people worldwide died, reducing the world's population by an additional 1 uh, 16th. It disappeared as suddenly as it arrived. Once the institutions were overwhelmed with the disposal of the bodies, in comes what? The Great Depression and the rise of fascism. As the stage was being set for the Second World War and the repopulation of Israel, fascism, written as the antithesis to communism, was introduced into Italy and Germany. It needed a little help, of course, Roman help. While Rome in the new fascist mold of Benito Mussolini was ready to play a direct role again, both Italy and Germany needed some financial help into getting it off the ground. So the American Roman patrons would once again step up to the plate to get it all going. Avril Harriman and Rockefeller through French Thiessen using a uh, young Prescott Bush as their bag man would get it all underway. So Remember those names, Rockefeller, Harriman, and Bush, and Fritz uh, Thiessen. They just needed a reliable person in Germany to lead the fascist effort, and, as usual, the Rothschild family was prepared to help. That help would come in the form of an illegitimate grandchild of the Baron Rothschild of the Austrian branch of the family, a fiery speaker and war hero and corporal from World War I better known as, drum roll please, Adolf Hitler. That's correct. See how the bloodlines go? The Rothschilds and Hitler. Hitler would attack the communist East, keeping it in check and further enslaving it to the money and credit it would need from the Rothschild bank, while at the same time creating the conditions that would make uh, provincial and backward Palestine a desirable place for the most desirable affluent and cosmopolitan Jews of Europe, who so far had shown scant interest in immigrating to it, while doing his best to exterminate the Eastern European Jews, who were relatively backward and poor, and were not descendants of the original Hebrew tribes. All right, remember that, okay? We're talking about the Khazars. They are not descendants of the original Hebrew tribes. All right, these are Eastern European um, and I wouldn't even like to use the word Jews, uh, we'll call them proselytes. Uh, proselytes or, or, or non-descendants, um, non-bloodline um, Hebrews. They're individuals of other nationalities that, um, b b that convert to Judaism. Okay? The Second World War, as Pike envisioned, would be fought to repopulate Israel and to set the stage for the final world war. One more note, the original Hebrew uh, tribes were what the West Caucasian would label black Africans. All right, That is a straight up fact. Everything about the, the continent of Africa has been whitewashed. All of its history, everything. But that's for view, uh, ongoing series in the future, not to get off of point what we're dealing with here. Okay, in comes the Holocaust and the Nazi ties to the Vatican. All right, that's the next step. All right, while the victors get to rewrite history, it can't always be obscure. They can't always obscure it as well as they would like, especially when it's as recent as the events of World War II. Pope Pius XII helped Adolf Hitler destroy German Catholic opposition to the Nazi regime 
and courage and extermination of the Jews through the very least profound indifference and bank much of the Nazi loot that the Vatican would use to finance the breakup of Yugoslavia years later when it was time to dismantle the communist system to allow Russia to return to its Russian Orthodox Christian roots to take part in the religious divisions of the third and final war okay keep that in mind all right keep tracking with me here we're going to get into the rest of this all right additionally the Vatican uh, conspired with the OSS and the new CIA to smuggle many ranking Nazis out of Germany at the conclusion of the war all right, that's under Operation uh, Paperclip. All right, as millions of Jews lay dead across Europe, or I don't like to use the word Jews, we'll say Khazars, victims of Hitler's forced labor camps and extermination squads in the East, the rush to immigrate to Palestine and repopulate the, the Jewish state was on. So World War II would end just as Pike and Rome wanted, with Israel repopulated and ready to play its key role in the final world war to mimic biblical prophecy they love to think that they are doing quote unquote God's work helping God out the war and its horrors will give Rome and its patrons another chance to found a world body of nations thanks in large part to the Council of Foreign Relations and Rockefellers they tirelessly behind the scenes work to make it happen he would even donate the land in valuable Manhattan and New York City to build on it what is he going to build? The United Nations. All right, let's pick up in the next video.